Merci. So hello everyone and welcome to this webinar on rare disease patient perspective on data sharing and data protection. So today we are going to present the result of a large scale survey on rare disease patient perspective on data sharing and data protection, together with the recommendation derived from the survey and from the long standing work we've been doing at URDIS on, on this topic. So we want this webinar to be as interactive as possible. So unfortunately we are too many, so we won't really be able to let you speak during the webinar, but you'll be able to to um, ask questions uh, via the uh, Q&A uh, section in which you can um, freely ask your question and we will um, try to answer to most of them all along the webinar. So <coughs> we... Um, and if we don't have time, we, we will circulate the answers by email. We'll see yes, how it course. goes. We'll do a little follow-up afterwards if we have too many questions that okay. we, we can't answer. So um, we um, have been working uh, a lot on this matter at your this because obviously data sharing and data protection is extremely important for rare disease patients because, of course, expertise is limited because diseases are rare and the populations are geographically dispersed. We um, are also uh, convinced, and it has been widely demonstrated, that sharing health data is really needed to advance scientific research and improve clinical benefits for, health, uh, for rare disease patients. And also, we can say that we are clearly not there in making effective and timely use of rare disease patient data to improve uh, health outcome, treatment, healthcare outcomes for patients. So what we wanted to do, to do with all this work and with this large scale quantitative survey was to uh, make sure that patients uh, have all the conditions to be engaged and to ensure their participation and engagement in, uh, in the process, in all data sharing initiative that could be um, organized and implemented. And also we want to make sure that their needs and their um, wishes are embedded within all these uh, research initiatives. So we, we would like to know maybe a, a bit who you are. Um, so there will be a question popping up. Uh, just uh, so if you are a rare disease patient, uh, representative, an EPAG or a volunteer, um, if you work uh, more in healthcare, if you are healthcare professionals or um, other type of stakeholders. So we will... Uh, give you just a, a little moment to to answer that um, i'm not sure if everybody has joined it maybe i think we might have started a, a minute or two too early <laughs> um but um uh, we just give you just a couple of minutes as well just to to make sure everyone can can and join, join and, yeah. and answer that question and see who we have online it would be nice for us to to know as well yeah, we can't really see so far how many people have joined. No. So how do you know? We've got 22 people so far. Okay. okay. I think so there's... We can yeah, wait a little bit. Yeah. Maybe we, we pause here just for a moment. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's just four o'clock, so we yeah. did start. Mm -mm. Sorry, our clock were a bit too, we were a bit too eager <laughs> to start. Um, okay. So mostly rare disease patient representative, but a few... Uh, also, uh, ERN uh, representative, academics, and healthcare professionals. So, it's uh, it's good to know that. And I'm guessing more people will join, but um, it's fine. Maybe we should uh, carry on. And so, I just as Sandra mentioned, this survey really come from it followed uh, several uh, approaches that we use to try and gather the patient uh, perspective and preferences on data sharing. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but just a few. One important one was uh, carried out in the framework of ArtiConnect, which was a um, EU-funded project uh, that ended last year, and in which we had so you're this coordinated a group of uh, patient representatives. So we call them the, the PAC, the Patient Advisory Council. Sixteen members, fifteen different rare diseases represented, and uh, with them we uh, also organize uh, focus groups on uh, to try and gather the perspective uh, of patient experts on data sharing and data protections. 
And uh, there's a publication that also uh, followed the, the activity. Uh, it's called You Should At Least Ask, and it was published uh, three years ago now. Uh, also, using the Rare Barometer uh, Voices program, we carried out a quantitative survey on um, the uh, participation of rare disease patients in research, mm -hmm. uh, and that was uh, done also a couple of years ago. So the objective of the survey was really, as also Sandra mentioned earlier, but really to gain a better understanding of the opinion, the expectation, and potentially the concerns as well that a patient and their family had about data sharing, but both in a research as well as healthcare settings. Most of the work that we've done before were really focused in a research context, so it was interesting to know whether that was different from uh, when you share data for, for healthcare. And so obviously this survey is meant to complement the previous work that was done uh, through RD Connect, either by confirming or maybe also adding uh, different type of findings. So the main goal really is to encourage researchers and healthcare and other stakeholders that are either in charge, so leading or participating in data sharing initiatives to actually recognize the importance to understand and consider, take into consideration the, pers the perspective of rare disease patients. And we also hope that that will trigger and encourage discussions about best practices in data sharing. So there are actually a number of uh, initiatives. Uh, so we wanted to maybe inform you on some of them that involve the sharing of patients' uh, health information. They have different focus. So they can, some of them focus on the analysis of symptoms that are directly reported by patients to, to better under, understand and identify the early signs of uh, rare diseases. There's also some initiative that actually try to uh, analyze and um, the, the testimonies that patients shared on social media, for example, to learn more about the effect of a treatment. Um, uh, there's also a number of uh, initiatives that explore uh, why the number of people that are affected by a disease varies between countries. So to try and better understand a disease, the etiology, the origin, and, uh, and also initiative trying to help people to manage their condition so that can be done by um, trying to develop project and initiative around smartphone applications and that kind of technology as well. <clears throat> So we wanted to ask you a, a question as well, just to see also where, where you at in the whole data sharing kind of perspective. And if you have uh, ever um, had any experience of participating uh, in a project that involves sharing uh, health data. So whether it was you that initiated or participated uh, in the governance of the project, or if you uh, only but uh, still very importantly uh, participated by sharing your data or if you've, you've had no experience whatsoever. So maybe we just pause for a moment to, to let you uh, uh, answer this question and see um, if you have or you haven't. So that will also tell us a bit more how to maybe tailor the, the support uh, in terms of sharing this uh, the information about ongoing initiatives um, and um, yeah, it's quite hard to have a visibility on, um, on that it's very interesting to us to to see that will definitely yeah. help us to to shape our activities so we have you there ah uh, so most of you haven't okay so hopefully that will help you also either to decide or to actually identify the, the different uh, projects or initiatives to, to share your data and to advance uh, research and, and benefit for patients. But it's also interesting to know that some of you actually initiated or participated in, in the governance. So that's really good. So it's quite a mix, uh, mixed audience. Yeah, definitely. So <clears throat> we... Um, uh, after all the work that uh, Virginie described, we have organized this uh, large scale quantitative survey. And the idea was to, <clears throat> because uh, via this uh, qualitative uh, discussion groups and focus groups, we had uh, surveyed uh, patients that were mainly patient representative or at least, you know, um, used to uh, uh, be engaged in advocacy activities. So the idea with this survey was to um, gain the perspective of a wider uh, population. So 
also the question were designed to be accessible to a wide range of educational background. It was also uh, translated in 23 languages, partly for the same reason, uh, because uh, so far we had work only uh, in English uh, via discussion groups. And we had like a three months uh, fieldwork uh, last year and 2013 respondents uh, took the survey. Uh, we were quite happy about the results because it's a subject that is quite technical, um, but uh, we saw that it's uh, still very interesting to a lot of people. And so the target population was patients and uh, their family member of over 16 years old. And in the end, 66 countries were represented in the sample and 664 diseases were represented. So we were just curious to know if some of you have participated in uh, either the focus group that we organized or maybe the quantitative survey uh, that uh, we disseminated. It's uh, yeah, important to see if... Uh, or if maybe we didn't, yeah, we, uh, we missed still the some same people. We, if, if, uh, if we needed to reach yeah, out a bit if, more, uh, maybe. Yeah, well, awareness regarding the survey was uh, sufficient. So this is the chat box. Okay. Okay, we're glad uh, you can join us as well. So, so most of you ah, didn't uh, okay. participate it. So, uh, but at, at the same time, it, it's normal because uh, it's true that the large quantitative survey was also more for patients uh, that are not necessarily engaged in advocacy activities. Mm. So maybe and that's why. <coughs> and there's yeah. uh, not only patient in the um, joining maybe us today. Just, so yeah. 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 Next slide. So uh, to design this quantitative survey, uh, we designed, as we do for each rare barometer survey that we carry out, a topic expert committee. And this topic expert committee represented a wide range of uh, background, including sociology, uh, legal aspects, uh, computational biology, rare disease patient advocacy, ethics, and also patient reported outcome uh, measurements. So we had um, discussion uh, and we had also so exchanges on the questionnaire and on the um, prioritization of the question to be able to, uh, to build the questionnaire. We also, um, based on our questionnaire, on the input from the qualitative uh, phase that was we described earlier, and we also uh, took a lot of questions that had already been um, used um, in the Eurobarometer survey that are the, the surveys from uh, the European Commission. Um, this uh, has enable us to compare rare disease patient perspective with uh, the perspectives from the general public. So we have uh, published the result of this survey um, uh, together with uh, Rebecca Dimond in the Orphanet Journal of Rare Diseases in July 2019. And um, we um, have you know, explored the, the results into details and also exposed our recommendation derived from the survey in this publication that is freely accessible online. And we also organized to be able to um, see how this work could be used and, uh, and utilized by uh, our network. We organized a uh, workshop at the EMM, presenting the result on the survey and also commenting the recommendations. So we have um, already started to shape the recommendation mm -hmm. based on this workshop. And <clears throat> now the next step is to design an infographic. So we have uh, started to do, um, uh, to do that, but the concrete outcome uh, of this uh, webinar will be to adjust, uh, to complete, and to take into account your feedback to be able to come up with a document that would be useful for everyone. So now we are gonna um, uh, give you um, an overview of uh, the results. It's, um, we chose some of the results because we weren't able to um, uh, describe all of them, obviously. And this is the result that will appear in the infographics. So uh, the results show very clearly and strongly substantiate the work that we have been doing uh, before. 
Well, these patients are clearly willing to share their data uh, to uh, foster research uh, on their disease. So 97% would be ready to share their data to better understand the mechanism and causes of the disease, 97 uh, to develop new treatment on their disease, and 97 to improve diagnosis on their disease. And um, obviously for rare disease patients, uh, the advantages um, are way more important than the risk and it's obvious uh, in all the discussion that we had with mm -hmm. patient with the, and just we <clears throat> wanted to show this quote that highlight uh, why it's so important so we are only six families uh, in uh, the country affected by this if we don't offer our database i think it's impossible for someone to help us to know much about us and uh, <clears throat> Clearly, rare disease patients uh, are specific regarding uh, the willingness to share their data, and we explored also all the publication on uh, the general public perception on sharing their data. And rare disease patients are clearly uh, more inclined to share their data than the general population. So this is only one figure, but um, that um, illustrate what we uh, what we are saying. So only 37 percent of the general population declare that they would be ready to share their data. So clearly we are um, in a different settings uh, with rare disease patients. It's also important to see, so that was one of the objective of the survey, uh, that they are clearly willing to share their data in healthcare settings. Mm -hmm. So it's very important in the context of the ERNs uh, that aims you know, to um, establish a data sharing platform to improve health care outcome for patients. So 95% are also willing to uh, share their data in this context. And uh, what we can say for this willingness to share data, it's really shared across all socio-demographic uh, categories, uh, whether the diseases are uh, severe or less severe, uh, whether you are a woman or a man mm -hmm. and so on. It's really, really, um, uh, there's a broad consensus uh, uh, around the necessity to share data for rare disease patients. So, so the, the, the first recommendation is, um, actually comes from obviously the, the result of the, the survey, but also take into account the, the previous work and uh, initiative that was done in uh, um, regarding uh, uh, data sharing of, of, um, of patients' data. So this one is more specifically addressed to policymakers. Uh, the other one are a bit more general in terms of the, the audience that they target. But uh, so this one really is um, about to, to ensure that the implementation of the appropriate legislation, whether it's at European or national level, um, uh, are, are there to pursue the effort to, to foster the, the changes that are needed to further develop the existing one or to um, um, just create a new data sharing initiative in health and, and research for rare diseases. So it's a very general one, but it's one that without this, uh, then not much can happen. So obviously, we just needed to, to re remind um, people of the, the importance to have the, the backup of the legislation as well. That it has to go in, uh, in the same way. So we, we have a, a question for you, um, and I think, uh, okay, it's popping up now. So we would like to, to know whether you can already foresee uh, having potentially advocacy opportunities, whether it's in your region or in your country, uh, in the near future. And, um, and so you can answer yes or no there. And if you have any further details, then please do add them in the, in the chat box, uh, and because that also will help us to kind of tailor and develop uh, um, support uh, for you uh, in, uh, to help you in those advocacy opportunities for, for data sharing. So maybe we just wait a, a moment to give you the time to, to answer the question. <clears throat> I could maybe just comment a little bit as well that um, for that first recommendation, it obviously is also quite timely because uh, of the work undertaken by the uh, ERN, the European Reference Network, so to establish a, a dedicated data sharing platform that enabled the information, uh, the exchange of information and the mutual learning. Uh, to improve uh, the diagnosis and the care of rare disease patients. Yeah. So you can already see brilliant advocacy opportunities. So that's great. Uh, so 
please do we're not going to comment on, on your um, on the information that you're going to provide right now but that will definitely help us to to tailor a bit more and, and provide you with the appropriate support so please do write that in the chat box if you can i also wanted to mention um, the initiative that by several European countries of a declaration where the government <clears throat> commit to cooperate to deliver cross-border access to genomic information. So that's the One Million Genome Initiative. And this declaration has the potential to maximize the use of healthcare resources and advance the development of personalized medicine, especially in the rare disease field. Um, so at the moment, not all the countries have signed uh, that declaration, but it's uh, it's growing and uh, and there are specific activities now uh, that are planned within this initiative so um, just to give you a bit of context as well mm -hmm. so uh, what we saw also in these results uh, is that rare disease patients are not only willing to share their data for um, to find a cure for themselves or to improve their situation uh, very often they know that uh, the research project won't have an impact on their quality of life but could you know in the future or for the younger generation have an impact on the health status and quality of life of future generations. So they are really willing to share their data to improve research and disease on uh, other than theirs. And uh, just a little quote uh, from a patient uh, on this topic. I agree to share my data if the rare disease community gets benefit uh, from it. And this is something that we saw also in the focus group that we saw mm. in other surveys. So we do think that it's very important to uh, highlight uh, this aspect for the rare disease community. So the next recommendation is actually really targets a, a wider uh, range of stakeholders. So anyone really who's involved dire directly or indirectly in data sharing initiatives, so that include funders, the sp other sponsors of research, the clinician, researchers, uh, healthcare professionals, patient organization, and other non-profit organization like foundation, for example, that might or might not fund research but have an interest in in data sharing as well so um, it's important that uh, to emphasize the potential health benefits of the research study and the healthcare initiatives on future generation as well and on other disease area because as Sandra just explained uh, patient it is an incentive for the wide to ensure wider participation of patients in data sharing initiatives so now uh, we are going to switch to another part about the level of control that patients would like to have <clears throat> over their data. Uh, Sandra, sorry, I'm just going to interrupt with a question which I think is probably interesting to everybody. Yeah. Um, is the presentation going to be avail made available after the webinar? I know we're going to send out the recording. Yes, we will uh, send out the recording together with the presentation that we, uh, we deliver today. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. So um, uh, what we ask uh, to patients is that um, how much uh, control they would like to have over uh, the information that we, they would share. And what we, we can see is that it's not because patient uh, wants to share their data, are keen, very keen to share their data, that they uh, don't want to co have control over it. The, the two are really stated as two parallel requirements. So patient wants to share their data, but they want to keep control over it. And 80% uh, of the patients say that they want to keep full, so which corresponds to the grade of five, or to near full um, control over their data. So I think here it shows very strongly that patient wants to be recognized as active agent uh, in um, the way they participate in data sharing initiative. And um, within uh, this um, uh, question, we can see that women are more prone to request control over their data than men. Um, and also that uh, people that reside in the European Union um, are also more in favor of more control. So we do think, and this is something that we so uh, throughout the result is that uh, people that are uh, living in, in the European Union, um, there is like something cultural and also the debate mm -hmm. around, you know, the GDPR and so on have clearly uh, an impact on, on um, raising the concerns uh, about, you know, controlling your data and um, having some um, uh, uh, level of choice on which uh, can be done with the, what can be done with your data. 
the main uh, risk associated with data sharing for patients, so this is the top four risk uh, among a list of uh, others, and what we can see is that all the items related to using the rare disease patient data uh, in different contexts than what they have initially chosen or with um, uh, stakeholders that they haven't chosen in the beginning is what is uh, uh, the most worrying for patients. And it's interesting because, for example, they were less worried about all what is around fraud or um, uh, like being, uh, yeah, meeting of fraud basically. Or, mm -hmm. And what we can see also, because this question was um, also um, uh, used in the Eurobarometer, uh, the Commission, European Commission survey, and was, what we can see is that discrimination are really a very um, major risk uh, for according to patients. And it's really different from the general population. And we, truly believe that it's uh, very much linked to uh, the discrimination that rare disease patients are already experiencing in their everyday life. Um, also, <clears throat> what we can see is that mm, uh, opinions are mixed regarding mm -hmm. the, the sensitivity of information. So what we can say is that a lot of people, uh, despite the fact that they think their information is sensitive, are still in favor of sharing it. So it means that they believe a part of them believe in um, solutions to be able uh, to protect uh, their data. But what we can see also, <clears throat> I mean, when we carried out the focus group, there was clearly a specificity toward genetic information mm -hmm. that obviously you can't really um, see um, with this survey among a wider uh, population. Um, so um, I don't know, maybe this is a subject that um, needs to be uh, a bit discussed uh, among a, a wider public or but um, it's also in general we saw that patient representative and it was also shown in the sociodemographic analysis of the data were um, more concerned about the sensitivity of the data so this is something that is maybe not as shared among a wider population so <clears throat> the following recommendation again is addressed to um, the, the wider group of stakeholders involved in data sharing initiatives. Uh, it's to ensure that uh, robust standards are implemented to ensure secure, ethical and responsible data sharing while still putting in place the safeguards around data protection. Um, so on, on this and so I, that's why we have a question whether you feel well informed or not well informed, but for example, um, there is a uh, IRDIRC, the International Rare Disease Research Consortium, has a, a set of recognized resources uh, regarding the ethical and responsible data sharing. So there is an international charter of principle for sharing uh, biospecimen and data. Uh, that was actually done within the framework of the project RDConnect. It's an IRDIRC recognized resource. And uh, there's also several ongoing uh, initiatives that are testing the use, for example, of, of blockchain technology to protect personal data that have proved to be efficient tools to actually uh, protect personal data. So <coughs> we wanted to know whether you were well informed or not well informed about the existing resources uh, that actually explain the standards to ensure safe data sharing. And it'd be good to know that because then that means that maybe those uh, resources need to be uh, made more visible and accessible as well to, to everybody so that you know what exists. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily that comprehensive and not more can be done, but already making use of what's uh, in existing would, would be important to know if you, if you can access, if you know about them. Um, so maybe giving you a, a second to answer. Okay, so that's it clear. seems <laughs> that they are not uh, visible enough. So again, that's also very useful in terms of the communication work that we and others have to do, uh, especially the IRDIRC, so the International Rare Disease Research Consortium, as well as all other initiatives uh, in terms of reaching out to the wider community. Thank you. So um, we also ask uh, patients uh, whether uh, they trusted um, a list of uh, stakeholders that could be in charge or participating in the governance of data sharing initiative. And uh, what we can see uh, from the result is that uh, not-for-profit stakeholders uh, are um, way more trusted than uh, people from the not-for-profit sector. And uh, so the differences are quite, um, quite um, high. 
And uh, what we can see also is that um, stakeholders that are very close to patients or involved in their everyday life are way more uh, trusted uh, than um, uh, stakeholders that are seems a bit far or uh, with, with whom patients have never been in contact uh, with. Uh, what we can see also um, is, um, so it wasn't in the infographic because we are still working uh, on it, but so the trust regarding governments uh, we have very mixed views uh, regarding uh, the trust in government, so we think we, we thought it's very important because um, uh, most of the time uh, governments are initiated, you know, uh, data sharing initiative, especially in the field of healthcare, and uh, it's very important to to see that they are not necessarily trusted and. Also, this trust vary um, uh, across the socio-demographic categories. So, um, people that are more educated or who finished uh, their education later uh, tend to trust less their governments than the other uh, than the other who finished school um, earlier. So, um, it's uh, we think that is very important to. Uh, we're going to show the recommendation uh, regarding that, but uh, we think that it's something that needs to be uh, taken into account. And same difference regarding patient representative and pa patient that are not engaged in advocacy activities, patient representative tend to trust more their government than uh, people that are not engaged in advocacy activities. Also, we ask uh, patients whether they would be ready to delegate their responsibility to an ethics committee. And again, we have mixed views on this uh, with a slight uh, majority, 49% that, that would be in favor and 43% that would be against. And, with, and the significant part that don't uh, actually uh, know because um, it's something that is obviously a bit complicated and that you need to be aware of. But um, and the, what we can see also is the willingness to delegate responsibility um, increases with the age. So um, it's also we we saw also across the result the effect of age and clearly younger respondents were more um, ready to have control over their data and to take responsibility over their data. And this is definitely. Um, uh, yes, and um, uh, effect, um, and obviously the relation to technology uh, uh, is changing. So yes, obviously the mm -hmm. kind of obvious uh, recommendation that follow from the results is that all stakeholders involved in data sharing initiatives should include representative from the trusted uh, organization that includes patient organization or the non-profit, as well as clinician and healthcare professional that are involved in, in the rare disease patient more daily life. So uh, because that is obviously going to uh, be an incentive um, for patients to share their data and to trust uh, how their data will be will be used. Um, so, yeah, um, we have now also a question for you, um, and that's going to be just uh, for you to answer on the on the chat, I think. But we would like to know in which way you think we could actually ensure the participation of the different uh, type of stakeholder in data sharing initiatives. So whether that's a healthcare professional, so your GP or your specialists, or researchers from academia, uh, and as well as patient organization, so that everyone has actually you know, a, a reason and a motivation to uh, be involved in, in data sharing initiative, because we saw that all of these stakeholders are trusted by patients. So we would like to ensure that all of them have um, incentives and, and reasons to, to participate. Um, so that's an open question. Obviously, it's not just a simple yes or no <coughs> answer. So again, if, um, if you don't mind taking a, a moment to, to um, get, tell us what, what you think about that in the in the chat box, that would be really helpful. We can maybe mm -hmm. take a moment. I think we're yeah, doing we can, okay with time. Yeah, I, I think it's okay, yeah. We I wondered if time, yeah. Maybe yeah, We've had a, another question, so perhaps we want to answer that while we're letting everyone have an opportunity to, to write in the chat box. Um, Demetrius has asked, how can we extrapolate our results? What, um, what are the options for sharing this research to other umbrella organizations, disease specific or general? If the results uh, lost it. Sorry, <laughs> it's moving. Um, yeah. If the results are relevant, we will have a stronger position. 
Um, so uh, what you uh, you have the possibility, so for each survey we carry out, you have the possibility to ask for the sorting of the results uh, for um, the population that is uh, most interesting for you. So for example, we can sort the data uh, by country and also uh, by disease. So we have the technical possibility, but let's say that um, the in, uh, I mean, for most diseases, obviously, we don't have a lot of um, respondents by disease, so it's going to be maybe complicated to sort the disease, to sort the result by disease. But what we can do is, for example, extract the result for uh, the ERNs uh, grouping, for example, or by country. So do not hesitate to come back to us to be able to get the result. Um, we what we do, I don't know if you're familiar with the functioning of our barometer, but what we do usually is that we have the global result and then we send you infographic adapted to your um, target uh, and uh, yeah, uh, advocacy um, area, let's say. Um, so do not hesitate to come back to us. Once the infographic will be ready, you will be able to have an adapted one for the, for the population that interests you. That should mm -hmm. help as well. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the point is that, so that's why we also would like to, to hear from you how we can ensure that uh, you can use that data, you know, as, as a tool and uh, uh, for, to advocate uh, for uh, data sharing within your own disease area or uh, within a group of disease in your country or in your region. So it's very good to, to hear from you on any suggestions or requests that you might have. Not sure we can... Um, guarantee yeah. to, to answer all of those but as much as possible obviously because that has to be used uh, and helpful for the whole community is there another question Sarah or uh, there's lots of comments related to your your question mm -hmm. and if you can read them um, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> You no, want me to pull out a f I can pull out a few. There's quite a yeah, lot of comments. It is um, a great screen. Okay. Uh, Ruth has said, I think we should try to get all named persons together to add to sharing the data. Um, Sue has said, send direct letters or emails. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, another, connecting the stakeholders is an, in an early phase is important. Mm -hmm. An example of a successful project would be useful for future projects and make periodic meetings with all stakeholders as a part of the project setup. Mm. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, for the moment, we have example that's uh, failed. We don't really have successful um, initiative in mind, or maybe you do. Uh, well, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. still thinking of uh, RD Connect, uh, for example. Yeah. I think uh, mm. in terms of sharing internally with all the project partners and with the patient community, we. Mm -hmm. We, we tried our best, it probably wasn't enough, but it was already a, a good start and there was a lot of communication uh, internally as well as you know externally, with, so with people who were not directly involved in the project. This is why to have a, some, you know, the, the patient advisory council was very useful because each of them represented a, a different uh, community coming from a different countries as well and they were able to then share, you know, downstream the result of the yeah. um, of the um, the project with the, with their own community, and I think the other partners, so the uh, mostly academics, did that as well with their own uh, networks. So um, there's always more, you know, that we can do, and um, mm -hmm. but hopefully they already kind of set up a, an example as to how best um, mm -hmm. to to share progress. And then we have another one here about anonymity, which I know is something that we covered in this survey. So it says the data, the data has to be absolutely anonymous and this has to be guaranteed. You should contact the patient organizations as well as medical doctors. The call for data sharing should be more successful when medical doctors are involved in sharing the call. Yes, of yeah. course. I think in the case of rare diseases, it's always a little bit more difficult to ensure complete anonymity because in the case of rare, very rare diseases if you only have a handful of information in that what kind of diseases and which country for example you could mm -hmm. almost re-identify the patients i mean not everyone can but um some people can so 
there's never going to be, I think, guarantee of complete an anonymity. Then that's up, obviously, to the patient to see whether the risk of mm -hmm. not being completely anonymous, despite you know all the best technological efforts, to um, if the risk really outweigh the the benefits of being involved in that um, mm -hmm. initiative. So this is why it's very important to take into consideration the perspective of of patients, and uh, and I think we might come to that as well to to be able to change your mind you know obviously yeah. that's a, a right within the gdpr but how that is actually implemented and uh, and transparent in the initiative is still something that we have to work on mm -hmm. and it's also a challenge when you want also to inform patient you know on the result and the outcome anonymization i mean it's still possible and you have solution but it's another um challenge you know that is uh Okay, another comment, maybe Sarah, or maybe um, you yeah, continue. I've got a few more. Um, mm -hmm. The one that says the privacy uh, regulation blocks a lot. I think it's very important that every country gathers the same data. It is difficult if there are al already several different systems. How can this be one system with all different computer programs? So it's not necessarily about having one system, but he, how can the different systems uh, talk to each other and be you know the new yeah. fancy world is yeah. interoperable um, but there's so that that is actually a, a, a very good <clears throat> point so to, having one system is i think an probably unrealistic right now there's already quite a few uh, ongoing and having been developed but is to ensure that they can talk with each other to each other and and share data across or make their data dis coverable which is uh, why there is this fair initiative which actually has been implemented and promoted within all the um, it's an ERDIRC recognized resources as well so if you go on the ERDIRC website you can have a bit more uh, information but it's what also the other projects are uh, encouraging to do is that when you collect the data at the source to ensure they are fair and FAIR is an acronym for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, so that uh, both uh, humans and machine computers can retrieve the data easily from different sources. So this is kind of probably the, the it's quite an endeavor also technically to put into place, but it is possible um, if, you, if you know how to do it. So there are resources out there that can help people to implement uh, that fair data, those fair data principles. Uh, and you can have uh, more information if you look at the recognized resources on the ERDF website. So, okay, we've got another one here. Mm -hmm. uh, Will the data be accepted by the policymaker in our country? I'm mm, not you sure. mean the, the data from the survey? Um, ah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the idea, you know, we, really with this survey, and this is not something that we have done <clears throat> in the past with other rare barometer survey, is that we published the result, you know, in a peer-reviewed journal. And uh, the reason uh, for this was to be able to speak to all stakeholders and involving researchers and also public bodies. Mm. And of course, um, uh, I mean, having like a, a peer-reviewed article means that, you know, other people have come on the on methodology, the, on the, methodology the approach. on the approach we have also um, a topic expert committee as I said earlier that was composed of sociologists of people specialized in patient reported outcome so um, if you want to communicate the result to uh, your governments and in your country I do think that you there's have no guarantees lot, yeah, yeah you have guarantees you have arguments to uh, value um, the, the figures uh, from this survey mm. So the answer is yes, basically. Yeah. <laughs> we do hope that. I mean, yeah, they yeah, should. Yeah. There's no reason why they shouldn't uh, mm. accept those figures are valid, credible, and representative. Obviously, we, mm. you know, they, it's what two and a half thousand. You said the respondents. Yes, or? exactly. So you, you you can't really say that it's fully representative. Because but it's the mean, largest it's of its, its kind. It's a, yeah, it's the first large scale quantitative survey on this topic. You have like six six countries represented, more than six hundred diseases. Um, and you know the the sample is very consistent in terms of age repartition, um, uh, women and women, uh, uh, women and men. Sorry, uh, repartition as well. Mm. So we really um, have a very solid sample um, in this survey. Any other comments, maybe? 
we can also mm. carry on and take yeah, comments yeah. a bit later on. If we'll uh, is that okay, Sarah? Or? Uh, yeah, we've got one more from Rene. If you want me just to sure. to to go for that. So it says we have just been part. We have just been involved in a meeting with. I'm not sure if you say EuroLink CAT or EuroLink CAT. Um, an EU funded project which, con which connects researchers with families. To ensure the project results will have an impact, they are looking to build networks with doctors, other researchers and patient organisations. It should be a requirement of such projects. So, but yeah, what kind of network and for what purposes? Because we, we have uh, several networks and like the European Ref Network is actually connecting also, but maybe at a higher level. And so is it, is it uh, a registry or... Uh... Maybe but in any case, the requirement seems to, to make uh, perfect sense. Um, I think that's only by, yes, uh, talking with each other and having a, a network in place that we can move things forward. So it seems like a, a worthy initiative. Maybe we will yeah, dig into... Yes, uh, yeah, the, we can um, find we out can more keep, as well. Yeah, and, we can uh, mm. collaborate or exchange uh, with the, the person who uh, highlighted this initiative. Yeah, maybe um, to, to have... see how we can help and... Uh... Okay, mm. that's fine. <clears throat> so uh, now um, in this survey, we also ask questions about how to best uh, communicate uh, with patients and what was... Um, really interesting to see is that all the um, uh, items related to inform uh, to information that patient could have over their disease the possibility to discuss to be informed on the results so we saw that information was really key um, as incentives to participate in such uh, initiative and also it was interesting to put this in parallel with the focus group where people were often saying oh I participated in this project but I never get any feedback on it I wasn't like, informed about the outcome of the project so um, it's a strong strong incentive and it's a strong requirements from uh, the patient. Also, we um, ask what was um, maybe um, the most important information to receive uh, for patients if they participate in this kind of initiative. And uh, they say that um, details on how the project could be beneficial for their disease was uh, the, uh, the most important thing. And also they were really keen to have a brief summary of key information. Uh, we know that uh, sometimes it's hard to explain a very complicated subject um, in a few words, but we do think that it's very important to make mm -hmm. um, uh, the description of the pro project accessible um, to a lay uh, audience. And uh, also they were very keen to receive information about the data uh, management uh, rules. Um, after that, we uh, asked because, you know, we are always uh, talking about a uh, patient who wants to receive information and so on, but it's a bit hard to see how. And uh, so it's, it appears that uh, they are, the respondents were very keen to receive information via email, so almost all of them. Also, face-to-face uh, -face discussion uh, were very important, very high actually. Mm -hmm. uh, dedicated the website, attending conferences, 67%, and mobile app, uh, so only 56%. So I think it's, it's interesting because um, we can see that mobile app are not uh, likely to be used by everyone, and this is something on which we focus a lot. Mm -hmm. In a lot of initiatives so I think it's uh, it doesn't mean that we don't have to use them but maybe um, and this is also with where, what we can see in the um, sociodemographic analysis and that the of course the younger uh, respondents were more keen to use the app as compared to uh, the respondents that were more older and uh, also um, you have different uh, behavior depending on the country where you live um, people residing in the European Union are um, uh, less uh, keen to receive information via a mobile app. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a tool that has to be used, but we think also that other uh, means to receive information should be uh, considered and keep, uh, kept uh, in mind. And the ideal frequency to be informed about the result of uh, um, a project would be once a month. So that's kind of an in-between uh, position uh, mm -hmm. from patient. Um, they want to receive in 
information uh, quite often, but they don't want to be uh, overwhelmed by uh, by information at the same time. And but also what we can see uh, on this um, uh, with this question is that obviously patient express different uh, preferences. So this is why also we advocate so that um, uh, preferences can be um, uh, you know, adapted and uh, that you can choose how you want to receive and the frequency um, uh, to which you want to receive information. Yes, so therefore uh, the uh, following recommendation is to uh, that it's important to promote the development of and also to implement uh, dynamic systems. So by dynamic systems, we mean you know a system that enable patients to tailor their preferences uh, about uh, with who they share their data for which purpose. That's also a very important point, and to be able to change their preferences also also at any time basically so uh, those dynamic system would uh, uh, enable the possibility to express different attitudes and preferences and to have access to updated information at the same time on the research outcomes uh, so that it's actually the, the patient that proactively look for for that information so that um, in order to obviously increase the, the patient participation in research because the more patient participate the more data are shared the more benefit uh, for the rare disease this community so um, that is directly linked to, to the to the result of the survey the following recommendation is also that uh, to ensure that this happened then we need to have financial resources uh, to enable the development and to facilitate the access to relevant educational resource so that a uh, patient can make informed choices uh, whether to share or not to share the health related data in different for different purposes and in different contexts and also uh, financial resources need to be allocated so that um, the outcome of the data sharing initiative can be communicated uh, to the patients uh, that donate their or share their data for uh, for research or in in healthcare settings as well. So we wanted to ask you a question related to that as well, and uh, whether you have had uh, any experience of communicating uh, to your patient community, if you are a, a patient organization or your peers um, or your patients uh, that you care for, if you're a healthcare professional. Uh, or if you um, have any experiences yes, of receiving also information about those uh, kind of health and, and research projects and whether that was a positive or a negative experience and maybe if you can tell us a little bit more about it. So that's also an open question. So it would be nice if you could use the, the chat box to tell us a little bit about those experiences if, if you've had any and whether they were, you know, more or less positive. I guess there's different aspects. It might not be all black or, or white, but it would be really interesting to hear about that. So um, we can learn actually from um, from what was what worked well for you and what didn't work so well um, potentially. Yeah. And I don't know if maybe we can also pause and see uh, Sarah if there's any uh, comments that we can maybe discuss uh, yeah it. we have another question that's come in mm -hmm. um, I'd like to ask how can a doctor from an EU country that does not participate to ERN centers being updated with new information being released to ERN networks I think that's asking how can those doctors not part of that network get the information so Sorry, yeah, um, I think obviously not every doctors can be directly involved in an ERNs but um, they're all the doctors should be more or less linked to a center of excellence who is uh, actually uh, either directly uh, an official partner of our inner ERN or what they call also affiliated partner. So that information should be able to flow down to, um, yeah, um, to reach the, the GP, but I mean the GP or the specialist, but I think the GP or the specialist need also to take a proactive approach and get in touch with the center of excellence uh, for or, or reference uh, for the, the diseases that um, uh, the patient they have uh, have and uh, to get more information on that. So it's, it's a, I think the responsibility is, is shared between ERNs and, and all healthcare professional to, to have a proactive uh, approach to, to find the information. 
I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that because you might have also a, a different idea of how best to do it. Um, it's a shame we can't see the comment. I don't know why yeah, on our screen we can't reach. Uh, we've, had, we've had a few responses to the question that you're posing at the moment around experience of communicating. Okay, did you see both positive and negative kind yeah. of experience? Or? Uh, yeah. We've had one, one negative is too little feedback. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's that's yeah. obviously, yes. Yeah. Makes sense. Mm. Uh, someone else has said ERN outcomes may also be published in scientific journals. Yes. And also ERNs mm -hmm. have a dedicated website. They have newsletter. And I think yeah. you can uh, subscribe to the newsletter um, if you are interested in that uh, specific ERN. So in the kind of uh, the group of diseases that they cover uh, so that you can be directly informed as well. It's good ideas. Yeah. And um, uh, Eleni says new diagnosed patients were willing to talk mostly to a patient rather than a relative or doctor. Um, I, I, yeah, mm -hmm. I guess that's also an individual kind of preference so this is a different need maybe that we didn't really cover uh, yes, in this uh, survey no but, uh, we, yeah, we, yeah we, we didn't go that far i guess it depends yeah. on on what you know talk but if it's about you know potential developing treatments development of treatments or uh, sharing experience or support of what works obviously there's nothing that can replace uh, sharing experience with your peers um, but at the same time, uh, other type of information can only be, really be um, given by by a healthcare professional. Um, so, yeah. Mm, but yeah. You, but everybody is different. Have the possibility via Rare Connect, for example, to exchange with the communities. Very good um, point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's uh, the purpose of uh, this uh, uh, social um, network uh, yes. that was initiated uh, by URDs and also um, within, you know, Facebook uh, workplace. Uh, workspace, workplace, uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, you have the possibility. Uh, um, to, to exchange, exchange as well and, with your peers yeah. if you're newly diagnosed yeah, you yeah. can mm -hmm. find a community uh, on the rare connect uh, website you can type and, and look for the community um, of that disease yeah. and share with the uh, anyone who's in that group and yeah. can be in anywhere in the world and it's it's translated mm -hmm. so yeah. there's no language barriers on, mm -hmm. on that one as well so and this is also the role of patient organization um, in the end and, yeah uh, and yeah yeah thanks Eleni mm -hmm. for yeah. bringing that up mm -hmm. yeah um, and Ruth says, my experience with researchers is that everybody wants the patients to come to their expert centres, but the rare disease patients are not able to travel all around the country to participate in research projects. So I think we need to have more research working with disease registries and biobanks. Mm -mm. Yes, definitely. We have um, so identified that the barriers to research mm. and travels. Uh, For if, uh, when it comes to yes, yeah. to mm -hmm. to bio samples, also biological kind of specimen, whether it's blood or indeed, it's it's good that the. Um, there's a bit more um, collaboration with, with, you know, at, at the regional level as well so that uh, patients don't have to travel that much. But when it comes to health information, that's actually the, you know, the purpose of the European Reference Network is that the expertise uh, travel, but not the patients so that um, they don't have to go anywhere, basically. And, well, uh, they have to go to their center of, of uh, expertise. That, that is true. Um, but uh, when it's specialized, uh, highly specialized healthcare, there's obviously only a, a few, um, you know, people in a, in a country that are actually specialized and and uh, and have that knowledge about your disease, if any, mm -hmm. sometimes. But and then one more we've had um, with reference to health research projects, it helps if patients are informed beforehand about the positive aspects. Beforehand. The positive, yeah, about it. I didn't get the question. So I think it's saying um, it helps to get patients buy-in if they're informed beforehand about the positive aspects that the project might have for them. Mm -hmm. About the out, the potential outcomes, for example, or yeah, 
-hmm. Okay, yes. so that that was also we the, talked about a bit yeah. earlier. Yeah, they have to emphasize the 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 benefits. the benefits for the disease that is under study if it's a specific disease, but also for future degeneration for other type mm -hmm. of diseases, um, because the research has far-reaching consequences mm -hmm. sometimes. So. And sometimes they don't really communicate about the research because they think that it's not going to have like an impact on the patient. But this is exactly what we are saying, that it's good also to emphasize future mm. uh, impacts and the impact on other... Um, but I think this is why we want it, because those recommendations might sound trivial, but actually sometimes researchers or healthcare, when they put a, a project together, they obviously are trying to think about you know the, the priority and the immediate immediate needs in terms of the, the budget to in line with the activities but we should not underestimate the importance of the communication activities and if they don't have financial resources allocated to that then it's going to take the last place on the priority uh, agenda and it's not going to get done and if it's not done then patient will not hear about the research mm -hmm. will not be informed and will not participate it's and a bit like engage all along the process as a well. vicious yeah. circle so this is why yeah. it's important to uh, take that into account at the start when of the design of the of the research of the project if it's uh, even if it's healthcare yeah. shall we yeah. carry on and yeah. then we can take uh, some more um, later on probably so it's um, ah, it's the end yeah. okay <laughs> <laughs> So that is, yes, so it's just if you have any other comment at all on the recommendation, also maybe on the infographics, because it would be nicer so that either if it's now or you can send the comments and the suggestions also via email. So to Sandra, uh, you didn't put your... True. Uh, gonna, we are going to send a follow-up email uh, after the webinar with the link, with the link to the recording uh, and recorded the session, the PowerPoint and also the infographic. So um, yeah, yeah, you so can comment, you can comment later on. Yeah, yeah, because sometimes it was a bit quick or hard to think about uh, um, solutions or examples um, in only one hour. So mm. yes, we are gonna follow up. But maybe I don't know, Sarah. We could take a couple more comments or questions. Yeah. If uh, yes, we've got um, a question here about the the questionnaire actually so is the questionnaire open access slash available to run in our own populations yes it is open access and we can send the questionnaire to you no problem yeah mm -mm. and uh, in the publication by the way you have all the questions uh, that appear um, uh, clearly um, and uh, entirely but we can also send the questionnaire <clears throat> um. Okay, and I think this one is around the positive and negative experience of uh, research projects. Mm -hmm. um, so presentation after conclusion of a project slash publication. Positive, the information was good. Negative, patients that were included were not personally contacted that the project was completed and many did not know about the publication or the presentation. Generally, communication is good at the start when patients need to be included or give permission and limited when the project is ending. Following up and giving updates in a more continuous way is important to grow trust. That's, yeah. uh, that's excellent and, yeah, yeah. and very good point. And I think what we're trying to do um, um, in our activities, at least that's what I'm trying to do and other of my colleagues as well, is... Um, is actually also advocate for the needs uh, because every research project, at least scientific research project, is monitored uh, to um, a smaller or greater extent. But now to also have a patient representative that actually are involved in that evaluation and monitoring. So when um, there is some great plans uh, that is uh, in, you know, included in the proposal to ensure that those are follow up and implemented throughout the life of the project. So I I totally agree that that is definitely uh, some uh, downfall of, uh, of uh, some of the projects, but uh, we'd like to ensure that we put things in place so that it's, uh, it, it, happen, it doesn't happen anymore, basically. And it, it's, um, carried, the efforts are carried out throughout mm -hmm. the life of the projects. 
Um, we had another point of it earlier from Anna as well. She makes an interesting point here, saying we need to advocate to change the systems of rewards and recognitions for researchers and clinicians. Mm -hmm. Currently, clinicians and clinical researchers are rewarded for publishing their work by default, making sharing of the data with others less encouraging. One example of such an initiative is the British Medical Journal, which requires patient partnership as a criteria in its publications. We could imagine the same idea for data sharing. Absolutely, no, that's a great yeah. point. And yeah. hopefully uh, it's uh, something that we can aspire to. It's one of the best practice that we should implement uh, at every uh, mm -hmm. level, whether it's uh, a regional, yeah. national, or European. But it's definitely one of the main, of the main hurdle to data sharing currently. Mm -mm. Yeah, mm -mm. yeah, that is true. Mm -mm. So, thank you, Anna. That's yeah. a good point. Yeah. So maybe and, we yeah. can uh, follow up with you by email. By email and uh, yeah. so we have the email address of everybody who's registered, and they will all receive. Uh, so Sandra's email with the recording of the webinar mm. that might take a few days. Even uh, those who weren't able to join today will receive the, all the material following the webinar. Mm. And do not hesitate to give us your, your comments and suggestions also later on once you, you have time to, to look mm. through the, the presentation again. Yeah, and we are really uh, ready also to help you for your all uh, your advocacy initiative and project uh, to be able for, to use the result of the survey to get the you know results sorted out for your country and so mm -hmm. on so do not hesitate to ask and to come back to us to uh, be able to use the results mm. thank you thank you very much thank you bye bye <laughs>